Hello, Robbie. Welcome to the 100X show. Hi, how are you? Not bad. A uh, lot of volatility in the market uh, at the moment, Robbie. Um, so, so before we dive in, into that, Robbie, I, I wanted to I wanted our audience to learn uh, about Animoca Benz and about mm-hmm. your background and about yourself and your crypto journey. Um, sure. So, <clears throat> Sure, no problem. Um, so I've always been in TMT, telecoms, media technology, uh, my whole career. I, I started out in telecoms back in the 90s um, doing mobile. And then uh, at that time, it was just voice because that's all there was. Um, and then I spent uh, three years um, doing my first, well, actually four years doing my first web startup uh, in the late 90s. Um, it was a web development business. And that's actually where I met Yat, who's the co-founder of Animoca Brands. So we've been friends for a long time. Um, I spent 10 years in traditional media, so TV, um, outdoor, magazines. Uh, and then I joined Yat in Animoca Brands about, uh, let's see, about 10 years ago now. Uh, and at that time, we were a mobile, free-to-play, casual game studio. And our, our focus was you know, 100% gaming, 100% mobile. Um, and we, I think, were you know, doing reasonably well as a mid-sized game, game studio. Uh, we went public in 2015. Um, but we were always looking for new areas of growth. And so we tried lots of different you know, strategies. We focused a lot on brands. Obviously, it's in the name of the company. Um, we're quite famous for, for being a licensee of, of IP and creating games from licensed IP. Um, but in 2017, we came across something new. Um, and that was, you know, obviously, the summer of 2017. Um, ICOs were very popular. And we started looking into blockchain. And we got to know the team at Axiom Zen, now called Dapper Labs, um, and collaborated with them on CryptoKitties. Uh, so we were the publishers of CryptoKitties uh, in Greater China, and that was where sort of our crypto journey began. Because you know they had just written the NFT standard for Ethereum that summer um, for the purpose of CryptoKitties, and once we started working with them on that, it really it's one of those things. I mean, you know, most people who are in crypto will tell you once once you kind of once you get it you get it and you can't kind of think about the world without it anymore it doesn't make sense um and i think that the same thing is true when it comes to games because for us the way we saw games you know historically free to play games have always been about buying virtual currency spending that virtual currency in a game for virtual items to enhance your experience, you know, extend your life of your character, customize your car, whatever it is, you know, and you buy cool virtual stuff. Um, And what we have in blockchain games is really basically just the same thing. The only difference is that you actually own your stuff. So you have property rights over it. So we tokenize those in-game items as NFTs. We tokenize the in-game currency as like a fungible token. Um, And so when you buy and own that stuff, you can then have agency over it. You can do what you want with it. You can sell it on OpenSea or some other marketplace. You can trade it with your friends or you can you know, potentially bring it to another game with you. Um, and that's something that's never been done in games before. So we, we looked at this and we're, we're like, this is just how games need to be made. It makes no sense for games not to be this way. And, and so one day all games should be this way. So let's, let's get started. Yes, Robbie. Uh, one thing I learned is that you guys went, ha- have been in the market since the last five, six years. You guys have seen the cycles, like different crypto mm-hmm. cycles. And um, so, so in the last 18 months, I kind of felt there was a dislocation between private markets and, and public markets. I felt um, there was less support on the later stage uh, of the cycle, like either public listed or perhaps, let's say, Series C, Series D type of rounds for, for different crypto projects. So how do you kind of see the state of the market now after this huge contraction we are seeing lately? Uh, do, mm. you feel, uh, do you feel the valuation, especially of the gaming metaverse and NFT-based projects will go down? Do you kind of see the frequency of deals going down? Do you see check size decreasing? How do you kind of see the market evolving in the next couple of years, both on the private side and the public side? So I think the one thing that we've learned is that <clears throat> the market does move in cycles when it comes to particularly crypto valuations. Um, and volatility is something that we we accept as normal. Um, although I do think that it's a bit, you know, the volatility, the amplitude of the volatility does change over time. The swings are not as, as crazy as they used to be. 
um, on a percentage basis at least. And and I think that's a reflection of the maturing of the market. It's it's by no means mature. It's very early still, but I think it is maturing, uh, so to speak. And so I feel like the one thing that we don't know is we don't know how long this particular contraction will last. Um, but I do think that it's a positive thing because I think that we as a as an industry, and I say that specifically about the blockchain game industry uh, or entertainment industry. Um, I think we're here to stay now and the past two years of progress that we've made and the amount of capital that's been invested in the sector and the number of teams that have come in from other, you know, parts of technology or entertainment to start working in this business. Um, I think there's enough momentum now that I don't think, I don't think it's any longer a question of if there will be blockchain games. I think it's just a question of what percentage of the game industry will be blockchain games now, because I think we're here to stay. And so in that sort of picture, um, then the contraction is actually potentially a welcome thing. Um, you know, it does make it more challenging for companies that are fundraising, but I think that teams that are capable with good product and good ideas are still getting fundraising done. I mean, I mean, the market is not contracted to the point where people are just shutting off the taps. All it does is really, I think, scare off some of the um, some of the followers, the people who maybe were making sort of me too investments um, and not really concentrating and, and taking the sector quite seriously. So I think there's always that layer of sort of FOMO investors, um, and I'm talking about institutional investors, um, that maybe they're not, you know, not so interested because it doesn't feel like the flavor of the moment right now. Um, but I think the serious investors in the space, you know, are here to stay. Uh, talking about flavor of the moment, uh, Metaverse has been has been a trend. A lot of uh, Web2 companies are also taking it seriously. And I've had few guests on 100X show. Everybody has a different take on the definition of Metaverse. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, 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 in your view, what is actually a Metaverse and how sure. do you kind of see it evolving, let's say, Sure. Term, medium term, long term. So I, I take a very broad view of what I think the metaverse is. I mean, we can at, at, at one extreme, there's a very, I think, um, sci-fi oriented definition, which is that the metaverse has to be three dimensional and involve VR and things like that. And I, and I do think that that, that will come over time. Um, but I think it's many, many years away, um, frankly, um, before mass consumer adoption, I should say. Um, but I think to me, the metaverse is not actually that dissimilar to the online world and, and the lives we lead on the internet today. But I think the distinguishing characteristic about the metaverse is actually revolves around two things that I think blockchain gives you. One is digital rights, so property ownership of digital stuff and digital spaces. Um, and then the second thing is interoperability based on open standards. So that's what distinguishes it from today. So today we have incredible metaverse-like worlds. We have great games like Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite and people, you know, socialize and go to concerts and do all kinds of great stuff there. But the one, th the two things that I mentioned are not possible in these kind of worlds right now. You can't really own anything of your own because fundamentally, you know, at best you're renting from the landlord, which is the game developer. Um, and then they're not open, meaning I can't take all the cool stuff I bought in Roblox and bring it into Fortnite. It's just not possible. And so I think blockchain actually um, becomes a great leveler in this case, because what it means is that all of the various projects that get built on blockchain around the world doing different stuff, you know, games, art galleries, DeFi, whatever it is, we can connect them all together. And once you connect them all together, the aggregate of that interconnectivity, in my mind, that's the metaverse. So, so you did mention ownership and interoperability. Yes. So, so when we take one of the sub-segment of perhaps metaverse, uh, we can kind of say one of the sub-segment of metaverse is perhaps blockchain gaming. Mm -hmm. So do you think the difference between blockchain gaming and traditional gaming, uh, that the magical difference is, is only those two factors or are there other factors as well in, in your opinion? that makes blockchain gaming magical i think the games themselves become different for other f in many other ways because of these two fundamental facts so the game economy is different the types of different player constituencies are different how the developer makes money is different you know now you can have er like play and earn models and all kinds of different things in games 
But fundamentally, that's all inspired by the fact that you have the property rights and you have the openness. Yeah. So, so one of the things that have really fascinated me, like I have a background in economics, mm-hmm. is play to earn games and play, play and earn type of games and, and their uh, tokenomics. Uh, mm-hmm. So we have seen XC Infinity. We have recently seen Stepin kind of adopting a similar model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, 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 so, so there are a lot of different experimentation that has been taken, t- being uh, taken place right now, like triple tokens, complexing faucets. So, what are your views on this? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think they are sustainable? Are we still in the experimentation phase? And how do you kind of see this evolving? Like, do you feel sure. like these blockchain games will be economy of its own or, or, or are there projects? Uh, so this would be also interesting to kind of explore with you. So I think that um, definitely we're still in the experimentation phase. And I think that's important because I think that particularly as game makers, it's important for us to constantly be experimenting regardless of where we are in the market cycle because that's how innovation happens. And I think that they are ultimately going to be sustainable, but it may mean that we have to rethink what we think the definition of a game is. So for example, you know, you may have a very successful game like Axie Infinity, but the end game, if you will, um, is not for the people who own SLP and AXS tokens and Axie NFTs and things like that may not simply be Axie Infinity. It may be a much wider universe of products that can use all of those NFTs and in-game currencies. And so there may be a journey of content that happens over multiple titles, multiple experiences and metaverses. And I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to tease things that I know that other people don't know. I'm just speculating here, (laughs) but, but the idea is, I think it's, it's early to prejudge and say, well, you know, this game economy is not sustainable because maybe the idea of the economy is actually bigger than a single game. So, so in, in that sense, when we have this play to one type of games, uh, do you reckon tokenomics becomes very, very important? Like, is it, is it as important as, let's say, game development itself? Because everything revolves around that. Uh, like, do you perhaps need a macro level thinking? Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, it is. Tokenomics is very important, but I'd say it's not, it's not, um, it's not the tail that wags the dog. So in a traditional game, balancing your in-game economy is very important. And this is part of what makes a great game. And I think when you think about creating a blockchain game, tokenomics replaces that idea of game balance because it's impossible to balance a blockchain game because the market has its own forces. It's not solely up to the developer printing new stuff, so to speak. Um, and so I think that you have to think carefully through the tokenomics to help keep it healthy and sustainable, um, and also to focus on GDP, because a blockchain game is not just about revenue coming across the tills from the customers to the, to the, uh, to the developer one, in a one-way fashion. It's about promoting this GDP within your game environment, because much of it might be peer-to-peer. Um, and so you as the developer can benefit from a small transaction fee of the overall GDP, but, but your job is not to not to try to maximize sales, but to maximize health in the economy. So it's a more of a governmental kind of role. Yeah, that is actually very fascinating. So I, I wanted to double tap on that. So all the things you mentioned, how how does one go about designing an optimal token tokenomics? Like, like what are the key factors? Let's say when you're advising projects. I think the the number one the number one factor we think about is community because. One thing we've learned in making blockchain games over all these years is that every successful project, and it, this applies not just to games, but to PFP projects, to art, to, you know, and frankly, to financial services, DeFi and things like that. Um, in blockchain, it's about community. And so when you think of your tokenomics, you also want to think how to balance the incentives that you create through your tokenomics to encourage positive community. because if you have a great community, then everything will flow from that community. You know, activity, engagement, revenue, etc., will all come from the community because, of course, you know, if nobody's there, nothing happens. So I think we like to think about tokenomics as being community first, um, and then, whereas some developers, I think, will look at it and try to think about how to maximize revenue or how to my- maximize 
economic activity, for example. Um, but we feel like if you're focused on community, everything else will follow. That makes sense because when you have a strong community, I believe the network effects will flow. They'll, they'll tell their friends, their friends will tell their friends. And once you have the network effects going, yes, uh, given the nature of blockchain, instant vir- virality and, and multi-sided platforms, uh, yeah, it, it, it does make sense. Well, and also with blockchain, the thing is that you don't know where it's going to go. So if you'd talked to you know Alex and Jiho about Axie Infinity, you know, they never could have predicted that Gabby would create the guild system, right? They were just thinking about the game. And then all of a sudden, Gabby came along with YGG and created the idea of a guild, and their game got turbocharged, you know, 100x as a result. So I, th- and those are, those are, I guess you'd call them yes, positive externalities yes. in an economic sense. Um, but, but it was a very, very much an unintended consequence. And the, and the beauty of, being an open platform is that these kind of things can happen to the benefit of both parties. So in this case, you know, in this example, YGG has become an incredible business on its own because of this. But at the same time, it's not at the expense of Axie Infinity. It actually helped Axie Infinity also. So this open platform sort of format actually benefits everybody. I think that's that's the network effect you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Recently, I interviewed a, a broad, like a founder from a project called Breed It Out. They're in fact now helping uh, guilds manufacture NFTs and game assets. So helping guilds kind of expand yeah. as well. So so yeah, like like stacks upon stacks, you have these beautiful positive external, externality, and you, you don't know where things uh, things go. Um, so so Robbie, I also wanted to uh, explore uh, Animoca so Animoca Brands mm-hmm. portfolio, uh, both from the investment perspective as well as builder. I, I know you guys have built a few yes. and a few projects. And yeah, let's just explore some of the projects we're excited about. And Sure, no problem. Well, um, obviously, we're well known for the Sandbox. I think it's probably our most popular product at the moment. Um, and we're very proud of it. The team there, you know, I think it's one of those funny things. People, people sometimes they ask me, they're like, wow, so how did the Sandbox, you know, become so successful as if it's an overnight success because the sandbox as a title actually just celebrated its 10th birthday on Sunday. <laughs> so it began life as a, as a, as a mobile title, a two dimensional mobile title um, 10 years ago. And the team had the idea about five years ago to build a, a 3d version. And so we tried to help them on that journey as best we could um, to create it, but this time to implement the blockchain so the blockchain version of the sandbox that you know today has actually been in development since 2017. Um, and I think that that's reflective of the fact that, you know, we're kind of making it up as we go along in the blockchain game business. You know, many things that we're doing in games have never been done before. And so some, and, and sometimes you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to invent new things, you know. That's why the, the Sky Mavis guys decided to make Ronin um, their own chain because they're like, look, we just we need this for our game, um, and in fact, that's how Flow was born. Immutable, lots of chains were born just out of necessity, um, and so I think we're still in this high innovation phase in blockchain gaming. Um, you know, obviously, Sandbox is kind of a marquee project for us. Uh, we also have our Rev ecosystem. I think it's one of the few um, game products where you actually see a single token um, across a wide variety of different products because we created the Rev token as a token specifically for people who love motorsports or just anything on wheels, to be honest. So we have Rev Racing, we have MotoGP Ignition, we have Formula Formula E, um, High Voltage, uh, and we have now a new title called Torque Drift coming out from Grease Monkey in Australia. So we have a variety of motoring related titles um, that are all in our Rev ecosystem. So I'm very excited about that, particularly Torque Drift, since that's new and it's our first drifting title. So I'm really excited about that because I'm personally a big fan of of drifting. Um, And we also have uh, Phantom Galaxies, which is our first AAA. It's actually the first AAA blockchain game, um, which has been was in early access at the at the beginning of the year and now has has been bringing in users steadily over the last couple of months um, and that's quite exciting it's a it's a mech wars in space kind of title and people can own planets and asteroids and battle each other with robots in space i mean what's not to love very well very good um 
So, so Ravi, how do you manage the teams? Like you have a team where you're building stuff as, as, a, as a game studio yep. and then you're also investing. So how does, how does the organization structure look like and how, how does the uh, bifurcation of resources and, and management of those mm-hmm. resources goes about? Sure. So what, what we do is we've, we've got a very active um, strategic investing initiative that we do from our balance sheet. Um, and that's something that we started doing when we first um, started focusing on blockchain uh, back in 2017. So we've invested in a lot of companies that are you know, now well-known in the industry. And it began as a way to support our friends, frankly. But as we came to understand more about blockchain, it really be- it really became important for us to try to um, maximize those network effects that you were talking about earlier. And one of the ways that we can do this is through investing activity, because as we, you know, we have two jobs in our investing activity. One is to try to make investments that encourage more users to come to blockchain. So a lot of our investing actually is helping to support game developers from Web2 to build Web3 projects um, and products to onboard more users to blockchain because we think gaming is going to be the number one way to onboard mass consumer audiences to blockchain. And the other thing that we do with investing is we try to capitalize on those network effects because every company we invest in, we try to encourage them to you know, adhere to open standards because we think that's very important to have a vibrant multi-chain ecosystem and to interoperate their NFTs, if they have playable NFTs or you know their DeFi protocols, whatever, with other of our games and our investees. And that's a way we hope that we can slowly start to build some momentum for interoperability because interoperability is kind of the holy grail for gaming in blockchain because it's the one piece of functionality that is truly indisputably cool and you cannot do it in a traditional game. So no matter what kind of haters you find from traditional gaming, they all have to admit that if you could bring your content from one game to another, that would be a, a reason to do Web3. You, you, I mean, it's, you know, it's indisputable. And so we're, but that's very difficult because we don't have industry standards for this yet. Um, it's difficult to do between games. And so we thought, you know, several years ago that by investing in lots of companies, maybe we would have at least a better, stronger relationship with them to try to encourage them to interoperate their content. Um, and then maybe we can kind of start a snowball effect in the industry. Yeah, th- that is very interesting. So like one question, one follow-up question I have regarding interoperability is that now you're seeing different blockchain emerge, like different silos. So interoperability, mm-hmm. maybe perhaps let's say if there's one specific game built on one blockchain, you, you'll have, you perhaps have that composability. But let's say when you have these games uh, that are in different blockchain for example, in Avalanche, you have these subnets, and then in Solana, you you have games. So how like how how do you think the cross chain communication and cross chain interoperability will happen, or do you think sure. yeah, one one interesting question could be like it's better for a game to just compose over one layer one and just like just just focus on that in in that way it can communicate <clears> with <throat> different games, but then you have issues with scalability. How do you kind of think about that? Part? Sure. So I think the most important thing is first to be realistic about how to make, from a technical standpoint, the best possible user experience. Because what we want to solve is we want to have a great gaming experience for users on the one hand. And on the other hand, we want to try to have the largest possible audience. And so by nature, that means that first, um, I think it rules out on-chain gaming. Um, at least in today's blockchain worlds, you know, the idea of having a game completely on chain is not really workable, you know, um, forget about the price of gas. <laughs> um, but besides that, I think, um, you know, we think things are very, things like ownership, for example, of NFTs, that's crucial to have as on chain data, but gameplay itself, not necessary to be on chain. And so when you centralize gameplay, um, in order to give a very low latency, good experience to users, um, you can think about then creating games um, as we've done now with Phantom Galaxies, where you can enable ownership of NFTs across multiple chains, but bridging those NFTs into the same game experience. And that allows players to play with each other who are coming from different 
you know, chain ownership environments. And that way you can have one game kind of to rule them all, so to speak, um, to use a, to use the Lord of the Rings analogy. Um, because I think it's important that we cater to as wide as po- uh, uh, as wide an audience as possible. If we make a great AAA game like Phantom Galaxies, we don't want to be like, okay, well, you know, as long as you have, as long as you're on Polygon, you can play, but otherwise you Solana people, you can't play. That's, you know, th- th- it, it goes against the purpose of creating a great game because you want as many players to come and have fun as possible. So we want to open it up and create those bridges to enable people, regardless of where they have their their crypto or their NFTs uh, to come and play. Uh, so you did mention interoperability as one of the themes. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the other themes? Let's say the last investment committee meeting you had, Sure. Uh, what What are some of the other in, uh, interesting themes in, in gaming, metaverse, NFTs? Are you excited sure. about mm-hmm. or at least seeing the private market that you feel Animoca brand is either betting or should bet? Sure. So I think that um, we, as people will know, when they look at our investment for- portfolio, we're very broad. So we try to support projects on every chain. We try to support projects not just in gaming, but also in adjacent fields. So everything from art and music and other aspects of Web3 culture um, to DeFi as well, because we think that all of these have a relationship to what we do. Um, you know, as we've seen, you you would never believe that a DeFi protocol would have relevance for a game company, but now we know. You know, people will go and rent NFTs, or they will collateralize their NFTs to get DeFi loans, and there's all kinds of fun stuff that you can do because these are open and composable assets. So we want to also um, deploy our investment capital to support those kind of ideas because those kind of mashups are really cool and players love them. And so I think in terms of thematics, um, what we're seeing now is um, interesting pivots from traditional game companies who are, let's just say, sort of household brand names. Um, and so some of them are now starting to move into the space and put their toes in the water. And we would love to be there to help them bring some of that IP. Um, I think the other thing that we've seen a lot of is we've seen a lot of um, uh, IP from sports, for example, um, very interested in this sector. So we already work with some of them. You know, we're launching a collection with Manchester City Football Club this week and um, and we have a relationship, we have a, a joint venture with with One Football to do f- football IP more widely. Um, but I would love to move on to other sports, you know, cricket and tennis and, you know, you name it, more more car racing. You know, we work, as I said, with MotoGP and Formula E and these kinds. Um, so I think anywhere that there is consumer content of brands that consumers love already that we can create community around so again back to community um, then i think that that's an area that we want to be in yeah i, I love cricket and i think it's 100 percent underserved within, within web3 uh, apart from <laughs> one or two nft marketplaces i haven't come across any either any game or any any uh, type of application uh so, so robbie let's uh, moving on to the last leg of our podcast uh, now a couple of questions i'll have will be regarding advice Mm-hmm. So the first question is, uh, in, in recent times, um, recent turbulent times, uh, has there been any advice issued uh, to your to, to your portfolio companies to kind of navigate the market or navigate the funding, perhaps? So I think I think if anything, the advice that we tend to always give when when people ask is, in turbulent times like this, I think it just makes sense to be to take a more considered approach. Um, so I think one of the things that we saw in the fourth quarter and the first quarter of this year was a tremendous amount of um, what I, what I would call sort of acceleration or shortened timelines. So especially when people were raising funding um, we were seeing rounds getting done, you know, in a matter of days or weeks, people moving very, very fast. Um, And that's not to say that we weren't part of that. Obviously we, we like to move quickly too. Um, But I think now with the market turbulence, um, it allows people to take a breather and to do a little bit more diligence, due diligence, to take a little bit more time and to really look at, you know, from the, from the companies who are looking for funding from their perspective, um, to think seriously about what their capital needs really are, as opposed to, you know, potentially doing a, doing a fundraise 
because capital is available at a good price. So, you know, you're building up a little bit of a war chest. Um, I think now when capital is a little bit tighter, then it makes sense to think about really, you know, what do I need to sustain myself for the next 12 to 18 months and to, to really fill my plan? And maybe I shouldn't be looking for more than what I need. Yep, that's a simple yet a very good advice. Uh, so, so, Robbie, uh, my final question before we conclude the podcast will be regarding some of your critical learnings as CEO of Animoca Brands. Yes. Uh, so what have been your, your some of your learnings that you'd perhaps like to share? <laughs> what are my learnings? So I think um, definitely, I think um, every day is like going to school. Um, you know, I learn something almost every day. And this is something, this is a part of actually our investing activity that I particularly enjoy because I speak with so many teams, you know, on, literally every day I speak with, with a couple of new teams and they pitch their ideas and you get to learn from, you know, really enthusiastic, smart people and hear their take on the world and their take on how things, you know, how they think they can change the world with their product. And I think it's important to be open to all of those new ideas because we're fortunate enough to be working in a space where, you know, the next crazy idea could change the world, really. And and that's that's quite a privilege to work in an industry where you can have that that potential impact. Um, so I think it's important to be very open minded and to be very flexible because you may, you know, you have to adapt. You know, one of the things about making games is it takes a while to make a good game. And you may find that things change. So perfect example, when we started making um, making the sandbox, it was an Ethereum game because that's what made sense in 2017 and 2018. Um, and so before we launched, we actually migrated the whole game to Polygon because a scaling solution was a necessity by the time we actually launched the game. Um, and so a lot of stuff can change. I mean, that's frankly almost changing a blockchain in the middle of development. Um, so you have to be flexible and adaptable. And, and so I think that's my biggest learning is that all those kind of skills that we brought with us from traditional gaming just get exaggerated in this very fast moving world of blockchain gaming. Robbie, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to the 100X show. It was a pleasure speaking to you. I, I, I learned a lot and I, I believe our community uh, will also, when they see the podcast, uh, Take, take away good uh, lessons from you. Fantastic. Thanks for having me, Mehdi. I really appreciate it.